immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, above all victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, That hymn is unlike many hymns. Most of the hymns that we sing speak of God narratively. They tell the story of what God's been up to in the world. Or they speak relationally between us and God, what God has done for us and how we stand in receptivity to what God offers. But this hymn speaks categorically. It speaks of God as immortal, invisible, unwanting, unwasting, and silent as light, in light and accessible. It speaks of God in the way that philosophers speak about God. It speaks about God as theologians speak about God. It speaks about the God of the omnis, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. The God who Lord help you, if you suffered through the first day of introduction to philosophy, you might have learned about, you know, the the unmoved mover, that than which a greater cannot be conceived. Those sort of things that, that are so heady and theological. This hymn speaks of a God not wanting, not wasting. Theologians speak about God as having divine satiety, Got a flashed union card every now and then. Divine satiety means God needs nothing. God is sufficient in God's self. Because God needs nothing, because all of the universe is contained within the being of God, all the things that came into being came into being through him, the eternal word, the second person of the Trinity. Because all things belong to God and flow from God who is being itself, What do you get the God who has everything, right? Tough stocking to fill. God does not need. Because God doesn't need, God doesn't suffer. And so theologians speak of divine impassivity, that is, the impossibility for God to suffer. So this God is nice and neat. This God stays inside all the lines that we want to color about God. But the God of the Bible isn't like this God. Now most people, and I can tell by the, even your own eyes that are drooping above your masks, that you don't have any more interest in philosophy and theology than most people do. But I can tell you my very favorite book that I read in 2021 was The Experience of God. Being, consciousness, bliss. Oh, it was a page turner. David Bentley Hart, in case you want to look it up on Amazon. Really a great book, and and one that would reward you if you struggled through it. Anyway, I love this stuff, but most of you don't. But the Bible doesn't speak about God in the same way that theologians and philosophers do. In many ways, the Bible portrays God in a more challenging way, even if it is more relatable. So the Bible opens in the beginning with God creating. That fits perfectly well with the philosophical version of God as well as the biblical. But at the end of this creation, what does God do? God takes a nap. That doesn't sound like the philosophical image of God. God rests. And then God God makes humanity. How? By making mud pies and forming a man out of mud, and then doing mouth to mouth on this mud man to bring humanity to life. This is a very non-immortal, invisible, God-only wise kind of image of God, isn't it? Peculiar. And God in Scripture is sometimes hard to figure out. Not logically consistent, not following the rules of philosophy and theology. This God likes Abel's sacrifice, doesn't like Cain's, and we're never told why. 
this God plays favorites all the time. Abraham, out of all the people of the world, I'm picking you, you're the one. And, and not just Abraham for Pete's sake, why Jacob over Esau? Why Joseph over all his brothers? God seems to be arbitrary. This God is unusual. This is a God who you can enter into dialogue with and, and, and talk about how many people does it take to save a city that's full of unrighteousness? How many good folks have to be there? 100, 50, 10? And then when there aren't even 10, God rescues the few that are there before the city's destroyed. This is an unusual kind of God. This is not a God who's described in philosophy. This is a God who does not fit our neat expectations. And most of all, the story of the biblical God is one who refuses to remain ensconced in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. This is a God who chooses to become present to us. This is a God who insists upon being close to the creation that God has made. And this is not a new thing. This God who gets divine hands dirty and puts divine lips on mud to bring forth life, this is a God who has always been coming among us. This love of God that came down in Bethlehem also came down with a pillar of fire to guide the Israelites by night and a cloud to shield them from the sun by day. This same God came down by speaking through the law of Moses on Sinai to give them a vision of what the good life might be. This same God came down to inspire prophets to lead the people of God to live creatively and faithfully and justly in the world. This same God has always been coming to God's people. And so when God comes to us in the child in Bethlehem, this is nothing new to God, but new to us, that we finally get it. In the fullness of time, we experience this immortal, invisible, God only wise in flesh, apprehensible, touch, feel, smell, cradle the eternal word of God in our arms. That's how close God becomes. That's how vulnerable God makes God's self vulnerable enough to be held, vulnerable enough to be pierced by nails, vulnerable enough to be beset with a crown of thorns. God did not come among us just to see how the other half lives. God came for the whole experience from birth to death and to open to all of us a way beyond death so that we might be together with God eternally. There's nothing wrong with contemplating that philosophical, theological nature of God. But we remember that this God who is immortal and invisible, God only wise, in grace has chosen to be mortal and visible, a God with us guys. Amen.